thanks to all of you who uh, fought your way through traffic to, uh, to get here. It was a nightmare day. I, uh, I knew this when the traffic report was urgent at 6.30 a.m. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks all of you for making the effort to, to be here and uh, want to welcome both those of you here in the audience and those of you uh, watching this program at CSIS.org at the online feed. Uh, you can follow us uh, on Twitter at uh, hashtag CSIS Live at Shoal Chair. Uh, but we welcome those of you who are viewing uh, from really around the world. Thanks for your time and attention to this very important topic of infrastructure finance uh, innovation in the Asia Pacific. We are delighted to be uh, partnering for this event with the National Center for APEC. The National Center for APEC is a, a business association which leads the private sector engagement, U.S. private sector engagement in the APEC process. They've done a wonderful job at this for a, a number of years. They're based in Seattle, Washington, uh, but they visit Washington, D.C. on occasion, and we're delighted to have them here today. The National Center for APEC al also serves as the secretariat for the U.S. APEC Business Advisory Council, the three presidentially appointed business executives who uh, represent U.S. business interests in the APEC uh, Business Advisory Council process. So we thank them for their generous sponsorship of this event. And uh, I'd like to start the event by welcoming the uh, president of the National Center for APEC uh, to introduce our keynote speaker, President uh, Monica Whaley, National Center for APEC. Thanks, Scott. It's been uh, the National Center's pleasure to work with CSIS now for, I think this is our second and a half year of, uh, of working together on um, the infrastructure and, and uh, investment work in APEC, and it's uh, always great to have, to have wonderful resources here, and obviously we're delighted to, to partner with you, Scott, old, old friend of the National Center's. This is the National Center's 20th year in existence. Um, when it started, there was APEC was new itself, and there was not a clear path as to how the private sector was going to engage with APEC, but clear that APEC was going to be um, focusing on issues and activities that were going to deal with the private sector. So uh, early on, a quite visionary person named Sandy Kristoff, and Larry Green will remember her well, um, said there's got to be something. There's got to be a way to, to put these things together. And so um, I was pleased to, to work with uh, her and a great team of folks that were um, involved in the Seattle meetings in 1993 to pull together the National Center. Um, but one of the uh, sort of the milestones along the way of these last 20 years have been working with the trade, U.S. Trade and Development Agency. The National Center was uh, pleased to partner with the agency on uh, several keynote or key initiatives that we did. Uh, one first one was the Shanghai Model Port Project back in 2001 when um, when China hosted APAC, and then we worked on a, a trade uh, cargo security project in Thailand uh, with the Port of Lam Chabang. So it's been a great uh, partnership there as well. So it's my really my honor, uh, Lee, to introduce you this morning. Lee Zak is the director of the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, and she's been uh, there since. Let me my glasses on. Sorry, gang. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it doesn't say exactly when she started. It's 2009. Thank you. And um, but before that, has actually was an adjunct professor of law in international project finance. So I thought that was a particularly salient uh, piece of her history that brings her to this meeting this morning, as well as all the work the agency does helping U.S. exporters and uh, in, in a variety of ways, and really small and large U.S. exporters. I think they're one of the best agencies that actually works uh, across the board with small and medium enterprises as well as very large companies in getting these, these exciting projects done. So um, please help me welcome uh, Lee Zak, and thank you again, Scott, for NCSIS. Thank you very much, Monica, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Scott, uh, for, to CSIS for inviting me here this morning. It really is nice to look out and see so many familiar faces, both from the work that we're doing here in Washington, DC, but also the work that we're doing in the region. So I feel like it's really, we're all sort of coming home. And that's one of the things I wanted to do this morning, is just to be able to make a few points and have a bit of a conversation. 
And I guess I wish that you all were eavesdropping earlier today when Scott was talking about why we were having this event and why this region is so important. And as a matter of fact, when I was at the APEC meetings, President Obama had focused on the fact that nearly in the next five years, nearly 50% of the growth in the world is going to be in this region. What that leads us to are great opportunities, both with respect to trade, and that's why the administration is so focused on TPP, and again, I think we were mentioning this morning, I think clearly the people in this room understand the value of TPP. But one of the things I'm gonna ask you to do is to go home, talk to your neighbors, talk to the people you work with about what the value is, how important this region is to the US economy, and how important it is with respect to the growth of jobs in the US. And that's really what the focus is of TPP. But the other thing that we mentioned this morning and that was mentioned at the recent APEC meetings is that we really will not be able to take advantage of these trade agreements if there is not the appropriate infrastructure. And that's exactly where USTDA comes into play. As many of you know, what USTDA does is it links US businesses with infrastructure opportunities around the world. And we've been particularly active in this region. As a matter of fact, over the past three decades, we have funded over 600 projects in the region, focusing on infrastructure development. And as you know, we focus on win-win opportunities. So with those 600 activities, that has resulted in over $18 billion of US exports. So again, I think it demonstrates what we're talking about. There are opportunities abroad, but those are opportunities in the United States as well. And it's a very important approach to be able to focus both on the win-win. What are the goals abroad? And what is it that US business in particular brings to them? As I've been traveling in the region, and I've been doing quite a bit of that lately, there are three things that come to mind. And I know that during the panel, there's going to be discussions with respect to what some of the challenges are with respect to infrastructure. And I'd like to lay out three things um, that we've seen recently. And I'm going to use Vietnam as an example, but it could be any place in the region that we're focusing on. The first thing is that what we see is that there is a significant need for appropriate project planning. And I wanna thank Monica for mentioning the project finance background. And one of the very important aspects of that is before you can finance a project, you need to make sure that it's viable. And that's one of the things that, you, again, USTDA does, so we get to see it up close and personal, that we provide grant funding for feasibility studies that look at the legal, financial, and, and uh, regulatory feasibility of a, of a project. What that's led to is also recognizing the fact that in addition to looking at this feasibility, that we, there also may be other gaps between the point that a project is conceived and financed. And there's a significant need for funding for those types of projects. As a matter of fact, going back to the project finance days, three to 10% of a project, the bricks and mortars, is in the planning stage. What that does, however, is it's kind of a high risk environment. It's a little bit of the chicken or the egg. People are afraid to invest in the project planning because they don't know how it's gonna turn out. Which is again why agencies like the USTDA are very valuable partners in this. The other thing is it kind of gives us a bird's eye view of other things that might be needed. And as a matter of fact, in Vietnam, USTDA has been very active with respect to renewable energy. And we see that there's a significant interest in particular with respect to wind. But there was a bit of a challenge. As companies were looking to bring on wind power, they had to be able to get it into the grid. And as a result, USTDA worked with the government of Vietnam to tackle that particular problem.
So we worked on a wind grid interconnection code, which would allow for power to be able to get into the grid. So again, trying to fill those gaps so that we can move projects forward. The other thing we did, because we saw such a strong demand for renewables, is that we brought delegates to the United States from Vietnam, project sponsors focusing on wind. And I have to say, I'm really delighted um, that one of those project sponsors, which is the Kong Lai Construction and Trading Company, then went on to develop 100 megawatts of wind in Vietnam. And when I talk about the win-win opportunities, when they went forward in developing this wind power, they did it with GE turbines, and they did it with Exxon Bank financing. So what this demonstrates is bringing sort of a whole of government approach, and I think that's one of the things that you're really going to see. There really is today a Team USA that we've really focused on how we can bring all the players together. And so with this one project, what you saw, USTDA, project planning, Exxon Bank for financing, being able to bring people to the United States to visit, win-win for the United States. The other thing, of course, that you're going to hear more about um, this morning are the challenges with respect to financing. And as a matter of fact, I flipped through the PwC report um, and saw that you've indicated that there's going to be a need for, I hate to step on your line here, but um, $1 trillion in infrastructure every year between now and 2020. $1 trillion to continue the growth. That's a lot of money. So again, focusing on this whole of government approach, one of the things that has happened is that the US government has launched the Asia Pacific Clean Energy Program. And this is all of the agencies working together. I see representatives here, Rochelle's here from the Commerce Department. So this is the Commerce Department, State Department, USTDA, Exim Bank, OPEC, all focusing on how we can work together to be able to provide financing for some of these projects in the region. And as a matter of fact, we've developed a center. OPIC has joined us at USTDA's offices in Bangkok. And what the goal is, is to be able to have a one-stop shop where you can go to access Team USA, how it is that we can not only provide financing, but how we can leverage other financing at the same time. And frankly, I'm delighted to say, among the group, State Department, OPIC, and Exim Bank, they have announced commitments of $6 billion toward financing for clean energy in this area. So again, this is another opportunity, but I, the real goal here is not just to be able to provide that financing, but to see how it is that we can then leverage other financing as well. And as a matter of fact, it's one of the things that I talk about. You know, it's one thing to spend our money. I really love it when we can spend other people's money. Um, so our real goal is to see how it is that we can set up projects to be able to bring other people in, to catalyze other capital for these projects. And I'm very excited about some of the things that we're seeing come through the center now and where it is that we're going to be going in the, in the future. The third piece, and I want to leave some time for questions and answers, but the third challenge, and I know there also will be continued discussion on this today, but the third challenge that we see is one with respect to procurement. I cannot tell you the number of times in my recent travels to, to APEC, Vietnam, Philippines, China, I've heard, where are the Americans? I want to be sure that when that question is asked, we have a good answer. And the other thing that I keep hearing, and as a matter of fact, I will confess, it happened to be sort of in a discussion in the ABEC terms with some of our partner countries, the response was, oh, you know, U.S. is not going to win that procurement. They're too expensive. My response is, the U.S. is not too expensive. It depends how you value a procurement. It depends how you determine what expensive is. Expensive is having to pay for the same thing twice. 
not pay for it once. Expensive is having to pay for it next year instead of 10 years from now when you plan to. So USTDA developed a program, frankly, in response to US business community and to our partners who wanted to see more US business, which is referred to as the Global Procurement Initiative, focusing on best value. Now this initiative is sponsored by USTDA, but one of the things we did is that we actually selected a partner who's an expert in this area, and that's GW Law School. And we reached out to the development banks. All of the multilateral development banks agreed to be partners in this program. So we launched this program a little over a year ago, and our goal is to focus on areas and countries that are, as I put it, right at the tipping point, where they recognize they have an issue with respect to procurement, they may not have received what they wanted to receive, and now they want to make a change. And I have to say, that's the great thing about US Today. We're always focused on change. We're always focused on innovation. So as a matter of fact, again, Vietnam, and again, I'm using them as, a, as one of our examples, but it's many countries in the region. Vietnam actually has seen this issue. And they, they changed their law to provide for best value, not just low cost. Now, that is an achievement in itself. And it's something I think we all need to work toward in the region. But then the question came, how do you apply it? And of course you had procurement officials who have been applying low cost all along. So what we did is through this program, we funded uh, uh, advisors to be able to go to Vietnam from George, George Washington Law School as well as from USTDA. And we trained 170 procurement officials with respect to how to apply this best cost analysis. What we think this is going to do, and we're already seeing some of the results of this, this is gonna level the playing field for US business. It's now going to be a case when people look at the value that they get over time, it's going to be a level playing field for US businesses. The goal is for us not to hear where are the, where are the Americans, but the Americans are here because they have a fair system, a transparent system, a system that will get them what they want and also give US businesses an opportunity as well to demonstrate what they have. And I think this is going to be a very important part as the region is looking to develop their infrastructure, to continue their economic growth, to be able to get as many players as possible into the region. I think it's also gonna be vital to our trade to be able to get US businesses as part of developing the infrastructure. So I think what we're seeing, and you'll be hearing throughout the morning, this really is a region of opportunity. It's growing really quickly, and there is a significant interest. The interest is from around the world. There's a lot of competition out there that US businesses face, but I think there's no doubt in my mind that we can meet that competition. And frankly, there's no doubt that we have to meet that competition. It's important to our economy, as well as the economic growth in the region, because these are our markets. These are the markets that are growing for US goods and services. And I think the way that we can tackle some of these challenges and what we've seen, especially with NCAPEC and others, is it really is a matter of working together. There's significant opportunities of partnership between the public sector, the private sector, US, our international partners. And frankly, that's what US Today is all about, is that partnership, connecting the right people, but frankly, looking ahead toward the future. Because we're at the beginning of the process. We have to be able to have the vision to see where we're going. And it's again why I wanna thank CSIS and NCAPEC to give us the opportunity to have meetings like this, to gather information with respect to where we are going. But I think one of the things that's really true is that the only way we're gonna get there is if we're doing it together. So I wanna thank you very much um, for inviting me this morning. I look forward to questions. And I wanna thank all of you who made it here through uh, trials and tribulations of the metro and traffic. Um, I'm delighted to see you. Thanks very much.
Thank you, Director Zach. Uh, Director Zach has to catch a plane to Chicago for a JCCT meeting, so she's got a pretty busy day, but has agreed to stay and take a few questions. Uh, let me ask one while you're thinking of yours. Uh, you, were, you spent a lot of your fall in the region. Uh, at both of the, the, the APEC leaders meeting and the CEO summit. And being on the ground always gives you a different perspective. So could you just talk about what, what some of the highlights of your experience, what, 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 what were your takeaways from being on the ground in, in Asia? Um, yes, and I, I, I think it's been a tremendous time in being in, uh, uh, in Asia and focusing on where they want to go. Clearly, you know, one of the things is this focus on infrastructure. Um, two, there is a recognition of the fact that there has to be connectivity in the region. And I think that is extremely important. And I do want to give a shout out, I know they weren't able to be here, um, to the Philippines who are taking the leadership with respect to APEC. But from the moment that they started um, in China at the APEC meeting, they're already beginning their planning for 2015. And this connectivity the um, connection between the region is one that they have put as a priority. And I know that all of the countries are working together. And it's really interesting, the other thing that I'm really noticing is that there's actually quite an overlap with respect to sectors. Um, USTDA focuses on infrastructure, so we focus on energy and, and IT and transportation. But one of the things we're seeing is the overlap. And an example of that is that right now we have two projects that we're working with APEC on. One is with respect to transportation and energy, focusing on emissions reduction. And we're going to be doing a pilot project leading up to 2015 to working to reduce emissions with respect to aviation. But the really interesting part about that is that APEC is also partnering with us. They're putting funding in as well to fund some of the other countries. So these crossover areas between different sectors, as well as connectivity in the region, I think is one that is becoming extremely important and one that people are focusing on and also one that people are willing to put money behind. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn to the audience. Uh, just th three, three quick points before we open for questions. First. Wait for the microphone. After I call on you, wait for the microphone because of our online audience. They won't hear your question otherwise. Second, uh, give us your name and organization before you ask the question. And third, what I call the Alex Trebek rule, make sure that the question is in the form of a question, not a statement. <laughs> so, thank you. Yes, sir. Microphone. <laughs> oh, there it is. Thank you very much. Uh, well. I'm Andre Sobejo. First of all, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll have to keep it short because of your time, but what I basically, uh, I, I rep, I'm Andre Sobejo and I'm the chief representative uh, in Vietnam, director for Southeast Asia and uh, Washington, D.C. for the Interstate Traveler Company, and uh, they've designed a high speed magnetic levitation rail. So I basically, uh, your description of Vietnamese interest in renewable energy and everything fits everything I've ever experienced. And uh, so could I, um, I, I would like to come question? back to your company. Yes, my question is, can I get some help from your company to get restarted? It's a, I, I wanna tell you the story when maybe in email or something like that. Uh, because it would take time too long. Well, but. I was going to say, in response to your question, I'm going to have Tom Hardy stand. He's with us. And Anna Humphrey. And Clark's going to be scooting out with me. Um, so also, please follow up with them afterwards. Um, but I'm going to quickly respond to something you said about transportation and Vietnam in particular. Because when I was in Vietnam, one of the things we did is that we signed a grant focused on the Ho Chi Minh City light rail. And the interesting part about that, again, it's one of these crossover projects. It's focusing on the IT aspects and the interconnectivity um, with respect to IT. And we actually had a very good partner in Cisco. So it was an example of a US company working locally and where we can help provide additional information. So interesting things going on in transportation in Vietnam. Thank you. Thank Excellent. You. Another question? Yes, sir. Uh, 
Uh, hi, I'm Ian Ferguson with the Congressional Research Service. Uh, you were talking about, uh, at the beginning, about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, and how important it was to this. Um, but could you sort of describe, I guess, what would, what would actually be different in your job, in infrastructure, uh, in APEC, uh, you know, in, in this topic, if the TPP was finalized and completed than what it is now? Thank you, good question. A couple things. Um, one, I think we're gonna be very active um, because there's going to be a tremendous amount of infrastructure that's going to be needed as the TPP is in place. To be able to get those goods and services moving in the region and to be able to get them moving in a timely manner, there is going to need, there's going to be a need for infrastructure and there's going to be a need for assistance from outside the region, so it's a great opportunity for U.S. businesses. The other thing that it will do, it was, it'll allow for U.S. goods um, to be able to get into the region as one, as part of this infrastructure development, but generally. So there are significant benefits to the US. And what we do is we help um, to get those exports um, abroad. That's our mandate. It's economic development on one side, but focusing on how do you bring US exports. So for US TDA, I look forward to being extremely busy um, in the region. Uh, and I you know, really look forward to being able to bring sort of the export numbers to the region that the nation should have to develop jobs here in the U.S. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is John. I'm a student at Georgetown University. Um, I had the pleasure of doing an internship last year in Singapore, and I met with many companies involved in infrastructure development there. Um, American companies say it's hard to compete because of the Japanese. They basically sh uh, show up at a government's doorstep with a complete package with all the firms and financing and basically everyone needed to be involved in a project. So you mentioned the uh, Asia Pacific Clean Energy Program <clears throat> to bring together all the relevant agencies. Is this kind of a similar kind of initiative to make a one-stop shop so American companies are more competitive in the region? Thank you, great question and yes. Uh, clearly, I think the U.S. has focused on the fact that we really all have all the tools. And one of the things we want to be able to do is to be able to bring them together in a way that project sponsors, exporters, et cetera, can access them. So clearly, it's one of the reasons behind the center in Bangkok. But I have to say that all of our embassies in country have great representation from the commercial service and where there's not a commercial service representative, the State Department, where they are on the phone with us constantly. And I think that's one of the things that I have seen is that there is collaboration and communication among the US partners like I've never seen before in government. And I think this has made us extremely effective and it has been a way that we can bring our Team USA to level the playing field for US businesses and frankly to show the support in the same way that other countries show support for their exporters and for their project developers. One more question? Yes, in the back. Yes, sir. Thank you. And we take in turns too. <laughs> Thank you, Rob Tobiasen, formerly with U.S. Treasury in a tax position, now a private consultant. Uh, thank you for your presentation. When TDA does its feasibility studies, looks into feasibility grants, do you take into account assessments of the soundness and efficiency of the regulatory systems in a country, the tax, taxation systems, uh, corruption issues in those? Do you, do you look at not only developing the business side, but taking into account the regulatory taxation environment of the, of the country in particular? I have a one word answer, yes. Um, you know, clearly one of the important parts for investment that you'll be hearing more about is the regulatory environment. And that's a very important part when we do our feasibility studies is to be able to look at the regulatory environment as well as the technical and financial feasibility of a project. Well, please join me in thanking Director Zach for her presentation. Thank you.
Next, we are going to turn to the substance of the, uh, the challenge and opportunity of Asia Pacific infrastructure. Um, PricewaterhouseCoopers, or also known as PwC, is a global professional services firm uh, and is also the knowledge partner of the National Center for APEC. We're delighted to turn to PwC for a substantive overview of the opportunities and challenges of the Asia Pacific infrastructure environment. Representing PwC is Peter Raymond, America's leader for capital products and infrastructure. Peter. Thanks very much, Scott, and it's an honor to follow Director Zach. Uh, thank you so much for what a great introduction to the topic. Um, Scott, just a technical question for you. How do I advance the slides? <laughs> so I should have checked the logistics before I got up here. <laughs> That's all right. And while we're waiting for that, let me uh, just uh, let me just provide a few opening um, comments. Um, PwC has been involved in the infrastructure business for many years, and what I'm going to present to you today is some research that we have done on the development of the infrastructure markets. Um, across the globe, and you'll see the significance, uh, underscoring what Director Zach had said, you'll see the significance of Asia Pacific um, in that uh, area of development for infrastructure. So, um, okay, I see the clicker's on its way. <clears throat> I could speak extemporaneously, but I've got some interesting graphs and charts that I think you'll appreciate as well. Okay, I don't think I'll need a keyboard, but uh, I'll put that there. And so let's see if I can operate this effectively. Uh -huh. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Thanks very much. So um, interestingly, as, um, uh, as we're talking about infrastructure development in Asia Pacific, uh, many of us were affected by infrastructure issues in, the, in Washington, D.C. today. Uh, water main break affecting our metro system, so we all know how dependent we are on infrastructure. Um, just by a show of hands, I'd be curious, how many people have recently been in Asia in the past two years? And how many um, have been in China in the past two years? So most of you who have been in Asia have been in China. Um, PwC conducted research with Oxford Economics looking at the expected growth of infrastructure investment, capital projects and infrastructure investment across the globe from 2012 to 2025. And when I say capital projects and infrastructure, so we're expanding the purview, it's more than transportation, utilities, power, um, uh, water, and telecommunications. We looked at fixed capital investment in areas such as oil and gas, manufacturing, um, and uh, schools, hospitals, et cetera. We wanted to get a comprehensive picture of what fixed capital investment might look like over the next decade or so. And what I'm showing you in this chart, it may be a little difficult to, uh, to see, is that we've seen a definite recovery from the financial crisis era um, where infrastructure, capital projects, and infrastructure investment is ticking up significantly across the globe. To give you some numbers on this, the anticipated investment in capital projects and infrastructure between 2012 and 2025 is $78 trillion. That is a huge number. Um, it is not going to be surprising to you, then, that a significant amount of this investment is going to take, play, take place in Asia. So let's turn to that. Okay. Nope. Sorry, guys. I'm just learning my navigation here. There we are. <clears throat> So as you can see from this chart, and it'll be difficult probably for those in the back, thank you, that, um, that the sh there is a significant growth of infrastructure investment coming in Asia Pacific. And this is going to be largely driven by China. So let me give you a few statistics. Asia's share of global infrastructure spending is set to grow from 30% in 2012 to 40% in 2018 to 48% in 2025. We expect that in Asia, by the year 2025, 
some $5.3 trillion will be invested that year in capital projects and infrastructure. Clearly, in order to enable this kind of investment, government policies are going to be very important. So I want to show you some other dimensions of this investment. Let's see if I can put this up here. So this, I'm going to show you fixed asset investment as a percent of GDP. What you see in this chart is that the world average for fixed asset investment is about 22.2%. That's the average around the world. And you'll see a number of countries here are falling below that average investment for fixed capital investment. But I want to take a deeper dive and look at infrastructure in particular. So we're going to look at infrastructure as a percent of GDP, infrastructure investment. And what you see here is that globally, the average investment in infrastructure per GDP is about 3.8 percent. Whoops. Sorry, guys. My navigation skills are still developing. Um, but Philippines and Indonesia, for example, are underinvesting in their infrastructure development. And what we're seeing as a result, and this has been corroborated by a CEO survey we did in the APEC nations, is that CEOs who have responsibility for operations in ASEAN nations are saying that they expect significant infrastructure bottlenecks coming over the next several years as opposed to the past several years. So what you're seeing is that CEOs are saying, we're going to have a problem getting products to market, getting our, our uh, produce or goods shipped and delivered or manufactured um, in the region. Looking beyond the headlines then in terms of data, what we tried to do is identify the drivers of infrastructure development in the region, and, we've, and we identified five. Demand for new transport and utilities infrastructure, schools, healthcare facilities, and aged care, the wiring of Asia Pacific, bright lights in big cities, which has to do with urbanization, and finally, private sector platforms for, for growth. And what I'd like to do is talk about these trends or these drivers in a little bit more detail and then talk about the financing issues that are associated with it, this kind of infrastructure development and then turn to some of the constraints that we're seeing in the development of infrastructure in Asia. So let's go first to transportation. What you see here is the expected increase in investment in transportation and utilities infrastructure in select Asian Pacific nations comparing 2025 with 2010. And you can see that significant investments are expected and needed in these nations with uh, the Philippines at the very end. But you see the Republic of China is obviously, the People's Republic of China is obviously continuing a massive investment program in its transportation infrastructure. And then you walk down the, uh, the stack that way. This is roads infrastructure. What we're also seeing is a significant uptick in investment in heavy rail, light rail, urban rail, mobility, et cetera, all areas that are expected to increase over the next 10 to 12 years if the investment environment is correct. But hard infrastructure, like roads and rail, are not the only things that are going to be um, uh, affected by this wave of infrastructure investment. Okay. Here we go. Schools, healthcare facilities, and aged care. When we started looking at the data, we wanted to understand what the impact of demographic shifts were going to be in the Asia, in globally, but particularly in Asia Pacific. And what you see is a dichotomy. There are countries with significantly aging populations and countries with very young populations. And not surprisingly, what we found was the um, expected trend in investment in healthcare was much more significant amongst the aging populations, um, whereas the investment in education was more significant amongst those countries that are rising into the middle income and have a younger populations. But overall, we're seeing upticks in investments in both healthcare and education across, across the region. So let's talk then about moving to a digital economy. 
As many of you know, China is emerging as one of the largest e-commerce markets in the world. Uh, a number of you probably have investments in Alibaba, among others. But there are many other firms in China. Oops. I swear I didn't touch it. There we go. There are many other uh, firms in China that are involved in the digitization of that economy. We see much more coming. However, China overall ranks relatively behind the curve in terms of digital infrastructure when you compare it with countries like the United States or countries in Europe. Only 20 to 25 percent of small businesses in China have internet connections, compared to 75 percent in the U.S. This is according to Oxford Analytica. So what you see is there is significant opportunity for growth in the digital economy. Digital connections are very important across the region as well, as it will enable trade and commerce much more quickly. When we turn to the next trend, what we call bright lights in big cities, what this really is addressing is the growing trend towards urbanization across the world. And this is particularly the case in Asia. As many of you are aware, the OECD expects 70% of the global population to be living in cities by the year 2050 and 60% by the year 2030. But already, Asia is home to seven of the world's largest megacities. Urbanization has a, a very interesting dynamic. PwC has conducted a number of research studies with respect to this, let's call it a maturity model for cities as they move from kind of provision of basic electricity, you know, power, water, and shelter to more advanced stages of development. And that's what you see in this graph here, moving from survival mode to quality of life mode. As cities move into this quality of life direction, what you see is greater and greater investments in things like urban mobility, environmental protection, sustainable um, sources of transportation and, and, and living, energy conservation, but also investments in research and development and aspects of city life that improve not only the quality of living, but the economic vitality of those cities and their competitiveness on a global stage. What we see in Asia is significant, purposeful investment in city infrastructure to achieve that kind of outcomes for a number of cities. And what that means is significant investments in urban transportation and in mobility, um, in improved electricity grids, in improved water and wastewater systems, et cetera, as these cities emerge as economic power centers and economic competitors on the world stage. So cities are going to be a significant driver of infrastructure investment. Finally, private sector platforms. There we go. Um, again, this is driven off of our APEX CEO survey, where basically CEOs in the region are saying they are expecting to invest something like $56 billion over the next three to five years in distribution facilities, um, logistics, manufacturing facilities, et cetera, in the region. This is over and above the investments that governments and others may be making in core and hard infrastructure, such as transportation networks, power and utilities, et cetera. This is directly from the CEO surveys. One of the issues that they are trying to address is this connectivity between the regions. So as you, as you can imagine, with a very fractured region geographically, Infrastructure is essential to move products quickly to market. So the combination of private sector investment in manufacturing, distribution, and other facilities needs to be linked with investments in ports, rail, roads, and other infrastructure to enable infrastructure to grow and the economies to grow in Asia. So having looked at kind of five drivers of growth for infrastructure development in Asia, let's take a look at the uh, issue of finance. This is data from Prequin, and I'm going to um, discuss two sources of finance here, um, unlisted infrastructure funds and sovereign wealth funds, to give you a sense of you know, what sources of capital are out there to help fund some of this infrastructure development. Uh, Director Zach had mentioned this $1 trillion gap in investment uh, availability uh, in Asia Pacific. How is this investment gap going to be met? 
Some of that will come from these sources of capital. These sources of capital are a little easier to track than one-on-one -on -one private flows of capital, but they are not the only sources of capital. But I think they, they point to an interesting trend. What this chart shows you is uh, something in the, in, the, um, in the technology or the terminology of the industry is dry powder. This is the amount of funding that funds have available to invest in new infrastructure projects. And what you see here is that while um, the top line is North America, and while you know, there were some variations, obviously, uh, during the financial crisis, more and more capital is moving into North America for investment in infrastructure in North America as compared to Europe, and then Asia is very much at the bottom. So what that tells you is that the money is not flowing to Asia as one would expect it to, given the demands that I just went through, the drivers of infrastructure development, and the growth prospects in Asia. Another look at this, another way to look at this, another way to look at this, there it is, um, is to look at, uh, this is a snapshot of funds that are in the market for capital raising in the third quarter of 2014 by region. And what you see is that Asia, again, lags behind. 22 funds seeking about $11 billion in capital compared to Europe, where you have 48 funds looking for $32 billion in capital. Now, this is just a snapshot, but it underscores the theme that I'm trying to highlight here, and that is that despite the enormous opportunity for infrastructure development and investment, the money is not yet flowing to Asia the way you would expect it to. And finally, a quick look at sovereign wealth funds. I will get this navigation down. <laughs> Here we go. Um, a final look at sovereign wealth funds. Whoops, sorry guys. Final look at uh, sovereign wealth funds. What we see here is that, interestingly, this graph shows that 47% of assets under management are actually held by Asian, Asian sovereign wealth funds, with only 22% of those funds actually being in Asia. What that tells you is that the expertise for investing in infrastructure already exists in Asia. But again, the money has not been flowing there as you would expect it to. So let's talk about some of the reasons why it's not flowing there. This is data prepared by the World Bank. It's from their Ease of Doing Business report, and it's a ranking of APEC economies according to the Ease of Doing Business. And I know this is going to be hard to see, um, but down at the bottom here, you see a number of very important economies in Asia. Indonesia, 114th. The Philippines, number 95. Vietnam, 78. China, number 90. The remarks that Director Zak was making about TDA's efforts and other U.S. government entities' efforts to improve the investment environment are very much targeted at many of the challenges you see here with respect to ease of doing business. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we think is necessary to accomplish effective investment in the region. I got it. <laughs> small, small round of applause, thank you. <laughs> so what this is, is this is a kind of a hierarchy of um, needs that we have developed over time in working with our clients around the world. What are the basic building blocks to create an effective environment where infrastructure investment can happen more easily, more effectively, regardless of the country. So this is a, a general framework that we've used, and we, we are working to advise countries and regions on how to develop these basic building blocks so that they can create a sustainable infrastructure investment program. So let me highlight a few of them. Laying the foundations. Obviously, what's very important here is an effective and transparent regulatory environment which allows investors to understand the basic environment in which they will be placing their money. So for example, if you have, or you, if you're gonna invest in the electricity sector in a country, we heard about wind power, for example, what are the offtake arrangements for the power that you are generating and how certain are you 
that you will receive the tariffs, the rates that have been pledged in that contract environment. So getting that basic foundation under, underway is really important. And then you've got to be able to move to procuring private sector engagement effectively. Um, Director Zak, again, set up the conversation very nicely. Most of these countries do not have sophisticated procurement structures and processes in place that will allow sophisticated infrastructure developers and investors to effectively enter those markets on a regular routine basis. Procurement processes are essential. You have to have transparency. You need to have well-developed projects. You need to bring them to market in a consistent fashion. You need to adjudicate those contracts in an effective way. And then you need to maintain the integrity of those contracts over time. So getting the procurement process right is very important. And, and I will say that um, uh, those of you who are in the project finance arena will know this. These tend to be very complex engagements to get done. Very complex deals require a lot of legal support, a lot of um, arrangements that can lock in the value for both parties, the public sector and the private sector. If you have weak or flawed procurement processes, you're going to end up uh, with either bad projects or no projects. Um, you may get the occasional good projects done, but the, the experience around the world is if you've got a solid procurement process in place, you will end up with good results. But that means also well-equipped and trained individuals. And finally, that next level is building then a sustainable infrastructure investment program. So once you build, you have laid the foundations, you have the regulatory and legal frameworks in place, you've got a good procurement process in place, now you can start to develop a whole series, a pipeline of projects that you can bring to market and you can bring to market successfully. As you build that track record of success, you attract more investors into the market and then you start be being able to enable other things like greater local financing of these projects as the, as the risk declines in executing and financing these projects. You'll see more money from the domestic economy moving into the infrastructure investment area, as well as more global funds moving into that arena. So this kind of hierarchy of needs, if you will, the structure is something that most countries in the region are working on in one way or another. Efforts of TDA and other organizations to enhance this will be greatly appreciated and will facilitate the flow of investment. Rats. Oh, there it is. So, finally, in a couple of uh, summary thoughts here. What you see on this chart are the basic economic, social, and environmental factors that we believe are necessary to encourage infrastructure investment, whether it's in Asia Pacific or right here in the United States or elsewhere around the world. You have to have solid economic factors. A national vision helps. Say, we, we are opening our markets to infrastructure investment. Indonesia recently made a similar announcement. Um, this is the kind of investment we're looking for. These are the sectors we're looking for that investment in. We're going to set up the procurement processes to get it right. Obviously, macroeconomic stability is key. Stable legal and regulatory frameworks I've talked about, capacity to procure and develop, and then a risk and return balance. Many of these projects are risky. And many of the challenges that we've faced in infrastructure development, not only in Asia Pacific, but in the United States, have been that we've not gotten the risk-reward trade-offs right. We've not understood the risks of certain projects and who should bear those risks. Having the ability to analyze the risks on a project is critical to being able to get those projects right. We haven't talked much about this, but we cannot ignore it. Ethics and transparency is absolutely critical particularly if we want to attract investors from across the globe. The ability to collaborate between the public and private sectors and civil society is key as well, because these are generally public-private partnerships that are being developed. And a willingness to pay. Um, a number of years ago, actually in the 1990s, there were a number of water deals done in Asia. Many of you may be familiar with those. And one of the challenges those deals um, in encountered, and one of the challenges that water deals tend to encounter around the world is a willingness on the part of people in the society to pay the increased tariffs to allow 
water to actually take, to get potable water to their houses and to their areas. And that has been a challenge in many cases. Unfortunately, those deals have been reversed because popular opinion has been against them. Anticipating those kinds of challenges early on is critical to being successful in getting these deals done. I mentioned a track record of success. There is a, uh, there's nothing more compelling than a series of successfully executed projects in a standardized um, framework that attracts investment much more effectively than one-off projects do. And finally, everyone is concerned about environment and the impacts on environment. It's really important to have a transparent process by which environmental issues are identified and adjudicated and a transparent permitting process. These things can hold up projects indefinitely. So in conclusion, no oh, rats. I thought I was going to get it right the last time. In conclusion, infrastructure investment in Asia obviously is increasing and increasingly important. The competitive advantage of these nations will often be reflected in their infrastructure capabilities. Many of you may have seen the IMF's report that said $1 of properly invested funds in infrastructure yields $3 of economic benefit to a country. So those countries that are effectively and efficiently investing their money in infrastructure are likely to see outsized returns compared to their neighbors and competitors. Private capital is interested and available for infrastructure investment, but the conditions must be right. And this is where I think APEC and other organizations can help in creating those conditions for more effective infrastructure investment. So thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, and I uh, hope you'll be able to take a few questions uh, while sure. you're here. Thank you. Very happy to. Uh, any questions uh, from the audience? Same rules as before. Wait for the microphone. Uh, it's a question up here. Uh, state your name and organization and actually ask a question. Thank you. Please don't ask how to operate the, um, the slide. This is, <laughs> I won't do that. Uh, Murphy's Law has a number of corollaries applied to PowerPoints. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Jeff Hardy, and I'm with Caterpillar. And uh, Caterpillar is one of the ABAC members, and I'm an alternate member for Caterpillar and ABAC. And um, you mentioned APEC can help, and I just wanted to mention one initiative that's taking place in ABAC that ABAC USA is promoting, and that is uh, to encourage countries to complete an enablers of infrastructure investment checklist that looks at, it's a self-analysis, a self-review that countries would do, looking at um, how ready they are to attract investment. Hmm. And all the, the blocks that you have, building blocks, uh, these are built into the checklist. And so it looks at, are governments organized to attract investment? How do the agencies work with one another? Um, are PPP projects um, viable projects? And what kind of track record do they have in organizing those? Is financing available, debt financing and local currency financing? What kind of risks? What kind of investment climate is there? Land acquisition, IPR protection, and other things. So the U.S. government has just indicated they will complete the checklist uh, by ABAC-1, which is coming up in, in January in Hong Kong, and a few other countries have done the same. And so this is an opportunity, I think, for PwC, the, tr the tremendous uh, information you provided and you share with APEC, um, for us to try and publicize the outcomes mm. of these checklists so that we actually encourage companies to invest in the countries and it helps if they know what is going on. So uh, maybe we can partner with PwC in some way and also um, companies here, we can have public-private dialogues. And I just want to throw this out as an opportunity for us as we plan within ABAC what we're going to do to promote the checklist uh, going into 2015. Jeff, I, I wasn't aware of that initiative, but I think it's a terrific one. Um, and I think, uh, uh, you know, publishing lists like that allow countries then to focus on what they think they need to do to improve um, those uh, various elements of, of that checklist. I'd be delighted to speak with you afterwards and, and see how we could help in, in getting that word out. That's great, a great initiative. Thank you, Jeff. Is there a question here in the front? Yes, ma'am. Good morning, my name is Paloma. Um, I'm working at, in United Nations doing a recommendation for uh, doing PPPs in infrastructures that are connected with in, uh, international trade and e-business. 
And my goal is to recommend it uh, to governments and private sector to doing this kind of business. And the legal framework uh, in PPPs is not well developed. Nobody knows who is, what is a PPP project. So the, how, what are the tools that you recommend me uh, to solve uh, the gaps in le the legal framework? I know that the PPP units are, in some cases, are doing a very good job. But in other countries, it's, uh, there is a lack of transparency, and there is no any uh, unit or departments to help of that. What, what, do you, what do you think is the key factor to improve that gap? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. And, and uh, fortunately, I think we have some speakers from the ADB and potentially the World Bank here today. Um, those organizations, USAID, other bilateral and multilateral agencies have um, spent a fair amount of time and effort in developing um, legal um, framework examples and um, uh, procurement uh, examples and um, uh, structures and guidance documents. Um, there is now, as opposed to about 10 years ago, there is now um, a wealth of information available through those organizations that are models that countries can look at. The, the challenge is adopting and adapting those models to the particular issues of any country. And so that's where you need to take that kind of repository of global insight and translate it effectively for a country. And a PPP unit can do so. But it really does take national leadership to um, get a successful PPP program launched and sustained. And, uh, and that's really important. So it often takes um, a political leader in a country to say, uh, this is a priority for us. Uh, we are going to make the changes um, that we need to adjust the legal frameworks or the contractual frameworks so that we can enable more investment. Um, and sometimes that takes time. And, uh, and, and sometimes then you have changes of government that um, where the next government maybe places less emphasis on it. But there are good reference materials, but getting them translated into the national environment, I think, is, is key and probably the bigger roadblock at this point. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question, and hold that thought for the panel, because I think you, you may have some more uh, people who will want to comment on that, but thank you for the question. Is there another question? Yes, sir. Good morning. My name is Samuel Tumiwa. I'm with the Asian Development Bank here in Washington, D.C. Um, I just had a question about uh, the infrastructure and the amount of financing, but I think one of the biggest um, barriers has been project development. It's not mm -hmm. like there's a big shelf of projects that you go, I'm going to finance this project and I'll take this one and take that one. Yeah. And I think the biggest barrier is, yeah. you know, there is no, there aren't no, there, there, sorry, I can't speak English properly, but there are no projects that are out there that are just ready for financing. Mm -hmm. Do you have, in, in this study, do you have any opinion on, on this whole project development cycle that needs to be addressed? Thank uh, you. That, that's a, another great question. And, and, and clearly, uh, these projects are not just sitting out there um, available to be financed. They need to be developed, structured, packaged, and brought to market in the right way. And that, um, I think Director Zach had made a reference to the fact that three to 10% of the cost of a project um, is in planning, and there are some risks in doing that because you may not be able to bring those projects to market because you decide, oh, it's not gonna work. Um, there are ways to do that. And in fact, there's some good research and, and experience around the world on um, investment frameworks, a prioritization, a way in which governments can look at all different potential projects and decide this one looks like it's, uh, or this set of projects look like they are capable for private investment. So we'll take those a little bit further. This next basket over here looks like maybe it's just a public sector investment basket to smaller projects, uh, more di um, dispersed geographically, et cetera. And, and those tools, can, um, can be useful, but that goes along with uh, the previous question, getting the, the frameworks right, having the legal environment right, having a unit or a, a function in the government that can look at projects and start that preparation. But it often takes expertise, legal expertise and financial expertise to bring these projects ultimately to the point where they can, they can be financed and engaged on by the private sector. It's a, it's a big constraint. So one final question, gentlemen uh, over here. 
Um, my name is Kikuchi, and I'm with a small consulting firm nearby, Washington Research and Analysis. Um, I spend uh, time in Japan teaching a course in project financing. And uh, in the excellent presentation you had, especially of the building blocks, uh, I thought one thing missing, and following on to the, this Asian Development Bank gentleman's uh, point, is one of the toughest things is to determine the initial need and demand. Uh, in your presentation, it may have been hidden within, say, risk av avoidance and also willingness to pay. Mm. But government uh, plans often could be grandiose and has nothing to do very often uh, in the actual demand of, let's say, the society. Mm. And the toughest thing, uh, minus even in democratic conditions, is how to determine demand. And perhaps Price Waterhouse may have a mm. better way, especially looking behind, back on projects to see that how the demand determination process could have been flawed. Thank you. Another great question, um, and I, I think the answer to that is it's it's often the case that ambitions, uh, government ambitions, are uh, greater than the you know public purse or even the private purse can uh, can support. Um, this goes back to the question of proper analysis of projects. Some projects are just inherently governmental. They're you're not going to get private finance unless you. You can just set it up so that you have a contractual mechanism to pay the private sector to be involved. Others are, you know, involve demand risk, um, toll roads or port facilities or um, t telecommunications networks, et cetera, where the compensation comes from the use of that asset, and that's very, uh, very much set by the demand for the use of that asset. And uh, those are the kinds of analyses that that do need to be undertaken in evaluating which projects to bring to market and which, which not to. And, and frankly, uh, what, what we found is that uh, there are often um, a significant number of projects that people would like to bring to market which just are not, not bankable. Um, they just can't be um, effectively structured to engage the, the private sector. There are, um, uh, there are tools out there, investment frameworks that I mentioned that can help um, to evaluate that and then feasibility studies would be the next step beyond that. Um, not to advertise, but we did publish a paper <laughs> on, um, on transportation investment frameworks and how countries around the world are using those frameworks to prioritize projects and to allocate them for private financing or public, public financing and what are the tools that they use to do that. And um, I'd be happy to share that paper with others. Actually, thank you. It's a great offer. And what we'd like to do is link, uh, uh, provide a link to the paper sure. from the CSAS.org events page for this event. So uh, as you return home and uh, get, get back to thinking about this again, click on the, the links, the events page at CSAS.org, and you'll find a link to uh, PwC's paper. So please join me. This has been an outstanding uh, overview. Thank you, Peter, for your contribution. Thanks very much. And now let me invite the uh, panelists to come forward, and we'll begin the panel discussion. So the stairs are on this side. You can make that? You're in great shape. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Your knees are way better than mine. <laughs> All right, we'll, uh, we'll continue with our discussion, which so far I've, uh, one, of the, one of the best parts about being at CSIS is how much I learned just running events here and the, the, the kind of people that uh, we're able to, uh, to, to invite and attract 
Uh, I'm always impressed with the, with the content of, uh, of their contributions, and I think that will continue on this panel. Uh, we've heard a lot about sort of the, the issues and, and, and risks and opportunities associated with infrastructure in the Asia Pacific, and our, we brought together a group of experts to talk about uh, some of the solutions involved here. Uh, so, uh, uh, beginning on uh, my left, your right, uh, is Craig Stephenson. Craig is uh, the representative for the North American Representative Office of the Asia Development Bank. So he brings the views of the multilaterals. Uh, next, we would hear from uh, Alexia Latorta, who is Deputy Assistant Secretary of Development for Development Policy and Debt at the U.S. Department of Treasury. We'll have a, a broader sort of beyond APEC, a uh, broader perspective on, on uh, the U.S. government involvement and, uh, and other major government involvements in infrastructure finance and development. Uh, she'll, be, she'll be followed by Cameron Khan. Cameron is the Vice President of Compact Operations at the Millennium Challenge Corporation and will have sort of an on-the-ground view of project development and project support. Uh, and then finally, we'll hear from Larry Greenwood. Larry is Senior Managing Director of Government Relations uh, for MetLife Incorporated in Japan, but Larry is a, was a career diplomat in the United States, a one-time uh, board member of the, Inter of the uh, Asian Development Bank, and uh, very knowledgeable about APEC, was the uh, ambassador and senior official uh, for a U.S. senior official for APEC. So we're delighted to have the panel, and let me ask each panelist to uh, make about five minutes of comments, and then we'll open for a discussion with the audience. Uh, Craig. Thank you, Scott, and uh, CSIS for the opportunity for Asian Development Bank to join you today. I'm going to start with a few words about Asia and then uh, talk some more about Southeast Asia. Um, to begin, uh, Asia's rise as an economic force, you know, over the past 50 years has been nothing short of phenomenal. Uh, its influence in the global economy is increasing rapidly, prompting many to say the 21st century belongs to Asia. Uh, the ADB estimates that by 2050, Asia's per capita income could rise sixfold in, in uh, <coughs> purchasing power parity uh, to more than $40,000, and an additional 3 billion Asians could enjoy standards of living similar to those in North America and Europe today. I know that you know, may sound like a stretch to some of you, but uh, it's possible. Uh, as the global economy's center of gravity shifts towards Asia, the region could account for, for more than 50% of global output in 2050, or $174 trillion, up from the current 27% uh, and uh, half of global trade and investment. This, this promising outcome can only be achieved if Asia sustains its present growth momentum and addresses intergenerational um, policy, institutional, and governance challenges. If Asia's emergency, uh, emerging and frontier markets are to avoid falling into a middle income trap, they really need to create the foundations for the next phase of growth, and that is they need to invest in infrastructure. Southeast Asia's, or ASEAN's, development dilemma is one of relatively high levels of robust growth not yet translating into adequate and quality infrastructure. The disparities between ASEAN and OECD remain large. In each of the key sectors, roads, railways, phones, electricity, and clean water, the ASEAN region still has a fairly long way to go. And although the region has learned some valuable, even hard lessons, after the Asian financial crisis, ADB believes that that crisis has led to today's infrastructure crisis. Southeast Asia today has about 616 million people. There are 120,000 people moving into cities daily. It's no surprise that Southeast Asia's infrastructure needs are large. Um, and an interesting stat here, it, it, it took Europe to get to the point where, uh, you know, after the Industrial Revolution and all, for half of the population there to move into cities. It took the U.S. about 120 years, and there are a lot of countries in Asia today where that shift has occurred in less than 20 years. So when you look at infrastructure and the ability of governments and investors and others to kind of keep up with what's going on, you know, in the course of human history, we've never seen uh, urbanization of the kind that we're witnessing today. So when you're stuck in traffic in Jakarta and you're breathing dirty air in Manila and uh, 
and you kind of wonder why the canals are, 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 are clogged up uh, somewhere else. Uh, it's, it's not as, you know, because people aren't trying <laughs> to take care of these problems. It's just they're monumental. In 2010, ADB estimated that Asia needs $8.3 trillion, and Southeast Asia needs $1.1 trillion in infrastructure investments through 2020. This translates to between 5 and 9% of annual GDP spending on roads, railways, ports, urban development, power, telecom, irrigation, water supply, sanitation, and the like. However, with the possible exception of Vietnam, no ASEAN country has come close to what they need to spend. Indonesia's economy, as you know, it's on a roll nowadays, but, but it's only spending 2 or 3% of GDP on infrastructure, while we believe it should be spending at least twice as much. The same applies for the Philippines, um, Thailand, and Malaysia. My information's a bit dated, but as of 2010, private sector commitments for infrastructure projects had barely reached half of the $38 billion for such commitments in 1997. And considering annual investments of about $110 billion are required today, the fact that only a fraction of this amount currently comes from the private sector presents a large fiscal challenge for the public sector. The obvious solution is for policymakers to undertake investment climate reforms, which facilitate risk sharing between the public and private sectors. It's easier said than done. Uh, ASEAN countries possess significant domestic savings, more than $700 billion, most of which are being invested outside the region. Uh, I was in Bangkok before coming to Washington last year, and I know that uh, Thai banks uh, between them held about $14 billion in Korean bonds. Uh, that just didn't make any sense to me at the time. Uh, needs for infrastructure investment in Southeast Asia are large and growing. The region's development dilemma, if not its binding development constraint, is its inability to channel these savings into bankable infrastructure <coughs> projects. Memories of the 97 Asian financial crisis remain fresh in the minds of policy and <coughs> policymakers and investors. They're wary of risk and they don't want to be burned again. Investors in particular are unwilling to commit major resources for large projects over the long term without lots of guarantees, which governments are reluctant to provide. Unfortunately, this situation has persisted for 17 plus years now, undermining productivity growth, the foundation for income improvement in the process. Something has got to change. The ADB believes governments need to step up their game to fast track infrastructure delivery and clear bottlenecks to create a pipeline of transparent, well structured projects that allow for private investors and market mechanisms. It's also necessary to address a range of policy, institutional, and regulatory impediments, as Peter suggested earlier. In addition, countries need to resolve governance problems to establish transparent procurement procedures and to put in place clearly designed viability gap funding mechanisms. Multilateral institutions, ADB, World Bank, uh, have a role to play in all of this. So do the emerging players, such as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the New Development Bank. But between us, we don't have sufficient resources to fill the infrastructure funding gap on our own. We can, however, leverage our creditworthiness to mobilize Asian capital for Asian growth uh, by, for example, guaranteeing infrastructure bonds issued by local entities. In 2011, the ASEAN economies, together with ADB, under my former bosses, uh, Larry Greenwood's leadership, established uh, an ASEAN infrastructure fund with just under $500 million in equity capital as a first step to mobilize the region's resources for its infrastructure development needs. More recently, we've established a dedicated office and recruited a highly skilled team to, to promote uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, we've also invested in public, or I'm sorry, in uh, project preparation facilities namely in Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam. Uh, we did a few years ago, and these investments are just beginning to pay off. Uh, a lot more uh, such steps are required if the region is to sustain its momentum for growth and development. Um, in closing, I, 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 I want to say that 
uh, I believe the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is part of the solution to infrastructure development needs in Asia. Uh, but uh, I, I, I believe even more strongly that what governments in the region need to do is to mobilize much greater involvement by the private sector in the provision of infrastructure than we're seeing in these countries so far. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Alexia. Great. Thanks very much to CSIS, to Scott, and to the previous speakers and folks who asked questions for setting the stage and covering so much ground already, to, to, be, to, be, to be frank. I think the case has been made very strongly about the centrality of infrastructure development um, um, to growth. I think from Christine Lagarde to President Obama with the Build America Infrastructure Initiative right here in the U.S. to ministers from Singapore to Cameroon to Nigeria have talked about um, how infrastructure done well is such a key enabler to growth, to increasing the productivity of firms, um, to jobs, and also importantly, I work on development, to poverty reduction and meeting the basic needs of people. I think, Peter, you talked about schooling, health care, taking care of an aging population. Um, and so the case has been made, so I won't belabor that. But I think so the challenge then before us is really how do we find, develop first, I would say, and finance um, infrastructure in a way that's sustainable, that's productive, and that's viable. And I think against this backdrop that Peter also mentioned of huge demographic pressures in terms of global population growth, aging populations, the youth in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And U.S. Treasury as part of the Team USA that Director Zach um, spoke about is very committed to working on these issues globally. So I'll focus my remarks on sort of three brief chapters. The first one is touch on how infrastructure is financed. The second is to focus very much on the role of the multilateral development banks. So you touched a bit on this, Craig, already, but I'll elaborate on that. And finally, to share with you sort of U.S. Treasury's priorities and strategies in this area. So on the financing, again, the point has been made super clearly about how large the infrastructure financing gap is. So we'll just sort of underscore that again and move to how is infrastructure being financed today. So some of the numbers that we have from the World Bank and others um, sort of indicate that the bulk of financing for infrastructure really does come from um, public domestic resources. The global average, about 60 to 75 percent of infrastructure is financed by public domes domestic resources. About 20 to 30 percent by the private sector, and perhaps surprisingly to some of you, only about 5 to 8 percent by official financial flows. Of course, there's variations of these numbers in different parts of the world. For example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the percentage of um, official uh, finance is a little higher at around um, 13 to 15 percent. Um, the third point I want to make around uh, around the financing issue is just this, this, and you ended on this, Greg, the concept that the for the magnitudes of funding that we need, the private sector will have a huge role, and that there is there are large pools of private capital available for infrastructure given the right conditions. And I think you used the exact same words, Peter, but given the right conditions. And I'll come back to you um, on, on the right conditions in a second. I do want to say that we do need a bit of nuance when we talk about, however, the opportunities of private sector financing, because they flow differently. These flows flow differently to different parts of the world and to different sectors. So um, I know we're focusing on, on Asia, but I'll give another Africa example. So, if you look at foreign direct investment in sub-Saharan Africa, about 86% goes to um, the ICT sector. Very popular, the willingness to pay is there. Wastewater <coughs> management, sanitation issues, not a lot of interest. So we have to be much more nuanced about the opportunities of, of the private sector and where the public good infrastructure financing is really needed. So um, to my second chapter now, which is focusing on the role of the multilateral development um, banks. Um, and sort of uh, would argue that there are four main and critical roles for the multilateral development banks to play in this field. The first one, and, many, and this has been discussed already, is really creating the enabling environment, the right conditions. This is about providing the policy advice, the technical assistance to address policies that are distortionary, to address um, subsidies that are misplaced, to um, remove legal, regulatory, and financial sector constraints to greater in, uh, investment, especially long-term finance. Um, it's about the reforms needed to strengthen the key institutions for infrastructure, whether it's public utilities or regulatory institutions in various countries. And it's also about 
being creative about the kinds of financing tools that are needed, including, very importantly, risk management mechanisms. Um, so the goal here is really to create the conditions to unleash the private sector financing. The second role for the MDBs is very much to be able to continue to mobilize domestic resources that play such an important role. And so that's really about um, providing the policy advice and the technical assistance to deepen the domestic tax base of the countries that we're working in. That involves strengthening public financial management. It's about developing local bond markets that actually work. Um, and, and, and here it's really about helping countries uh, free up the resources to make their own investments in their infrastructure uh, futures. The third role, and I was thrilled to hear Director Zach make this point, to hear Peter make this point, is about optimizing planning, preparation, and thinking about downstream maintenance. And this is both at the project level, but also, and this point was made very importantly, at the sort of country level. So this idea of having a country think smartly, and the demand question, I think, that was raised um, from the gentleman who teaches a course on project finance was excellent. It's about the upfront thinking about what is my right mix, what is my infrastructure portfolio as a country that gets me both the economic value from certain projects and the development impact that I need. Not just my ideal, my dream, but what is actually feasible, what would be viable, and how do we develop those natural national infrastructure plans, the national vision that Peter um, um, described. So much more upfront planning work on this. And thinking about the sustainable operation and maintenance so that the investment today lasts and doesn't have to become a new requirement for new investment too quickly. I think the climate issue here is important, so climate proofing these investments I think is also something that we should um, think about. The last point on financing is the MDBs do have a role, although what they can contribute is tiny compared to the other sources of funding in providing catalytic funding, funding for priority projects to reduce the risk for demonstration effect so that others can come in, including the private sector. So um, I'll, I'll close now on sort of very quickly <coughs> sharing some of US um, Treasury's priorities in this space. The first one is really um, working with the multilateral development banks to focus more on this upstream planning work that I think is so critical. And so we supported the World Bank with its global infrastructure facility that is focusing on creating the pipeline of bankable projects, well-structured projects. Um, we also supported the, in, in, at the Asian Development Bank, the Asia Pacific uh, Project Preparation Facility that has very similar goals. Second thing that we're doing is really, because financing is still important, especially in terms of calico financing, is enhancing the lending capacity of these multilateral development banks. We supported reforms at the Asian Development Bank, at the World um, Bank, that will boost um, the lending capacity of these institutions by up to 40 to 50 percent. Now, not all of that will be for infrastructure financing, but a lot of it, a lot of it um, will be. And then the third is that there's sort of this public good aspects to, 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 to infrastructure um, Financing, And so we're really engaging internationally with APEC, um, with the G20, to focus on the know-how, the knowledge, the data, um, and the best practices that are needed to really make um, progress and meet the, the future needs. And this includes everything in APEC from um, uh, supporting uh, national countries that want to create PPP centers. Um, the G20 has launched the G20 Global um, Infrastructure Initiative that is going to help <coughs> increase the availability of data on the performance of projects, for example. A big problem for investments, they just don't have, there's no track record, no knowledge to, 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 to understand what the opportunities and the risks are. Creating a consolidated pipeline of projects, um, and there are many more examples. Um, so in conclusion, I'll say preparation, preparation, preparation. Can't be overstated. And then I just want to echo what previous speakers have said about we're looking for quality infrastructure. We're not just looking for infrastructure. We're looking for sustainable infrastructure. And so I was thrilled to see the optimal conditions that Peter um, presented. And I think the issues of, of transparency, good governance, the issues of managing environmental and social risks, the issues of debt sustainability that we haven't touched on um, as much, and procurement, which we've touched on a lot, are absolutely critical as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Alexia. <coughs> Cameron. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, everyone, uh, for staying engaged. I think a lot has been uh, said about the need for infrastructure. Let me just uh, organize my thoughts into two segments. First, uh, before joining the administration and coming to MCC, 
I spent about nine years, uh, so to speak, in the trenches in, in East Asia, working on uh, preparing PPPs and advising governments. So I'd like to make about four comments on what, what are the solutions, since this is supposed to be a panel on solutions. So let me make four comments on that, and then I'll talk to you about MCC and what we are doing and how we are engaged in Asia Pacific. So to start with, um, you know, in the old, uh, I think during the Clinton administration or before the Clinton campaign, there was this thing about, and it's the economy stupid, uh, and I'd like to just repeat that to say it's about the project stupid. Um, it really is about the projects. It is really not about finding more money and more money. Uh, I heard uh, Lee's speech, which I agree with, and I think the comment uh, that Peter made, Yes, there, there are very few funds in the market right now raising money for Asia Pacific, but that's because there are already funds that can't find deals. So why would you raise more funds? Um, yes, there is less capital flowing into East Asia, but you know, you look at other FDI going into East Asia in other sectors, there's no problem there. And there's a lot of uh, inter-Asia FDI uh, that is really booming. So. Our job as practitioners is to make our sector attractive enough, which is can we make infrastructure attractive destination for private capital? And the fact is we have thus far failed to do it. Let me uh, keep going with that. Second point, um, <clears throat> a lot of people have talked preparation planning. So let me tease out some of the implications just to add more flavor and make it a bit more controversial. So when we talk about infrastructure planning, there's a very fundamental step that a government has to take, which is to say, project, project, which way should I finance you? Should I use private capital? Should I use public budget? And there are inherent conflicts in there. Every public works ministry would rather have a lot of public budget and would rather have all the control over the project so they can finance it as a public project. They don't want the project to be sent over as a PPP. In fact, the good projects, they'd rather keep and show good progress and, you know, sort of set aside the bad ones, the questionable ones, which are very ambitious and say, yeah, let's try to do this one as a PPP boss. Same conflict exists in the multilaterals and the development uh, donor community. You know, you, you are providing a loan. What would you rather provide the loan for? You'd rather provide the loan for a project you can visualize that has cre clear economic value. So there is a conflict there. And if you look now at the advice that the governments are receiving, you'll be hard pressed to find a focus in this area. Which country uh, is it where we really have put serious covenants, conditions that the government put in place a system for identifying projects up front. And when you talk to private sector, which I have, you know, we do a lot of us every day, you, you talk to them and, and they will tell you a number of the projects which they would have loved to have invested in are encumbered with one type of money or the other coming from the donor community, coming from the public budget and so on. So this is a key area when we talk about solutions Let's focus on the problems that require solutions, and let's focus on uh, bad solutions that might be out there. Third area, sector policies matter. There was a time when the project finance community, back in the 70s, 80s, you could go to various countries, certainly in the Middle East, sign a contract, an agreement to do project finance. And it was, you know, backed by King, so on and so on, and you didn't have to worry about it. You have an agreement, you have your set of lawyers, it will be, um, you know, respected. Nowadays, with urbanization, with, de with decentralization, with democracy uh, taking hold of the world, you can't do that. There has to be a policy, there has to be a broad-based discussion around the uh, nation, people have to believe in the concept and they have to understand the value. So it's not just one agreement. That means there has to be a much deeper engagement, and that's why you see one or two deals happening, but they're not replicated. They don't go far enough. They don't 
uh, create a storm of other transactions like that because people spend so much time getting the one deal done and not get the policies right and don't have change of laws and change of public opinions around them. Last point, we talk a lot about this elusive concept of capacity. So people say, well, you know, country X really doesn't have the capacity to do PPPs and we need to provide them technical assistance and so on. All true, but we need to go down two or three layers into the, as they say, layers of the onion to really figure out what the issues are. Um, capacity for what? Capacity to, to be able to do what is very important. We seem to, in this very theoretical sense, expect every agency in a developing country to have the capacity to do project finance. And it's not true even in this country. You can go to you know, Port Authority of New York, they probably put out more commercial paper than any entity in the world. They don't have in-house expertise to do that. They have expertise to manage advisors, and they have a budget structure to hire professionals, people like Peter. Uh, who go out and actually structure these deals. That's the solution. Solution is not to just somehow imagine all these agencies in developing countries to have project finance experts and be able to pay them. It's not gonna happen. So uh, those are the four key things. I'm happy to discuss more uh, in the Q&A session. Let me just tell you about MCC quickly. MCC is a, a development agency of the United States government. We invest about a billion dollars a year. All of it is appropriated by the Congress. Um, we are extremely selective in how we pick our partner countries. So first level of risk is where you land, and then the second level of risk is where you invest. So we have a very quantitative process for how we select our investments. We build a model, economic model for a country to identify constraints to economic growth. <clears throat> and, excuse me, and then that defines where we will invest in that particular country. Um, we give grants, very big grants. Average size of our grant is $350 million. We don't pretend to be a bank. We don't pretend to be a guarantee agency. We find the grants are the most flexible instrument to work with private sector. Um, we don't have an IRR because we make grants, but we have economic rate of return as our driver. And we have our own threshold that we must pass for each investment. Every investment I am, uh, that MCC makes has to be quantifiable through an ERR model. We have a threshold of 10% ERR, which actually those of you who have done ERRs know it's quite, quite high. And I can trace back We've invested roughly about $10 billion over the last 10 years of our existence, and we can trace our ERR back to 174 beneficiaries. So that's how we build the model. So we know exactly who we have benefited, and we know exactly what the uh, return on that investment is. We, when we give these grants, we give the countries exactly five years to use the money. So whatever money is not used within the five years goes back to the treasury, you will be amazed to know how many projects miraculously get done because of this deadline. Um, and then last thing, we don't invest directly. We invest through a special purpose vehicle, which is a public entity that we ask the government to set up. And that's where we drop all our fiduciary controls, financial management, how they do procurement and so on. And we have a very, very proactive uh, management structure to, to ensure that the money is used the way it's, it should be used. In East Asia, just in closing, we uh, are quite active and we will be, we, our board just met. Uh, we have new investments coming up in East Asia, so I can tell you we'll be preparing new investments in, in uh, well, Indonesia, we are in, currently engaged. Uh, PPPs in renewable energy in particular. Uh, we're engaged in Philippines and we'll be preparing a new compact in the Philippines, in Mongolia. And then we're also expanding into South Asia. Africa, you all probably know, MCC has a very, very robust pipeline of investments. Also, Eastern Europe and Latin America. Um, give, let me just give you an example of how we operate. We, we leverage a lot of private capital uh, with our grants. Uh, so there are two, three different forms that can take. One would be an example from Amman, Jordan, where we are part of a big PPP program. So 
MCC grants go in to support the public P, if you will, the government uh, investment in the PPP scheme. So the government puts some, MCC help them with the rest, and then the, uh, the rest of the financing is raised by the private uh, entities. We just signed a transaction in uh, Ghana over the summer during the Africa Leader Summit where we are investing half a billion dollars in Ghana in the energy sector and that allows about four billion dollars of private investment to come in. So private investment is coming in on the generation side. MCC investment is on building the network to give economies a scale and then in the process through our engagement we are fixing the off-taker and making it uh, more bankable. So that's the kind of model we use. We can also use MCC grants for viability gap financing and other, uh, or project preparation. So I'll stop here, happy to answer questions during the Q&A session. Thank you, Cameron, and thank you for the conference bumper sticker, it's the project, stupid. <laughs> so, <laughs> appreciate it. Larry. Let me start where, uh, where Cameron also started, which is that uh, clearly there is an institution, there is an infrastructure gap in um, by official financing like uh, the multilaterals and MCC, and then uh, the rest, private sector. And, and so when you look at that, those numbers, clearly you're not going to see major increases in the government side, although as Craig said, you, we, we are pushing, and, and well, I should say the ADB is pushing, and World Bank are pushing some governments to increase the percentage of, uh, of the budget that they're, paying, that they're spending on infrastructure. But there's, on average, in Asia, you're not going to see a major increase in the percentage of, um, of budget money that goes into infrastructure. You're not going to see a major increases unless Treasury says, changes its position in MDB funding for infrastructure. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no. I'm sorry. That's, that was unfair. Um, but, but even if, it, but, but, but it's, it's, it's already very small. You're not going to see major increases in that. Um, uh, Congress, thank you. <laughs> and. Um, so obviously the increase is going to come from the private sector side. So where's, where's the private sector uh, money going to be coming from? Um, and what I want to talk about is the role that institutional investors can play in that, in that area. Because when you look at the numbers, uh, you know, we saw Peter's numbers on, for example, sovereign wealth funds, tens of billions, maybe $100 billion, uh, but if you add it all up, um, the infrastructure uh, funds, again, uh, as Cameron said, there's only so much out there because they're looking for bankable projects. But when you look at inst institutional investors, $50 trillion of assets under management worldwide. My own company is almost a trillion bucks, just one, one company. It's a small, modest company. Um, the, uh, so uh, now, obviously, not all of that is going to go into infrastructure. But, if you get, but as S&P did a study looking at if, in, if institutional investors, and it's not just insurers, it's also pension funds, worldwide increase the, uh, the percentage of, um, of, uh, of their allocation to, of their portfolio to infrastructure from the current about a little over 1% to 4%, which is not a major lift. Um, essentially, the, the financing gap, that, that is the, the, the difference between what governments are expected to put in and assumptions about what banks will do, and I'll talk a little bit about that, is filled. So you, the, the money clearly is there. The question is, how do you get more of institutional uh, investor money into infrastructure? Uh, and it's, it's a, it, it makes perfect sense to do that. And this, I'll go to, 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 to because, because currently uh, the major funding or a lot of the funding for infrastructure, and this is the case in ADB when I was there in terms of co-financing, comes from banks, from the private sector. But banks don't make a lot of sense to be funding 20-year 20, 20 assets. Uh, it, the, the, they're, they're obviously funded by short-term deposits. It doesn't make sense for them to be going out looking for 20-year assets. For insurance companies, we sell 20-year liabilities. We sell, tw we, sell, we sell life insurance policies that we have to pay off when somebody dies. And we're, and, 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 so it could be a 20, it could be a 30-year uh, promise that we have to then pr uh, fulfill. We're, we're, we're desperately begging for 20-year uh, assets. We want them. So the banks don't, shouldn't be carrying so many, um, but we want them, but why, so why, why aren't we getting, and we can't get enough. We can't find the, the long-term uh, assets on the, on the market. There's not enough bonds in the market, not enough corporate. Um, so we are looking for infrastructure. Infrastructure is a natural fit for institutional investors. 
So we have a working group under the overall APEC umbrella. It's called the Asia Pacific Financial Forum. We have a work stream on, uh, on how insurance companies and pensions can do more in the infrastructure space. The Sherpa of that work stream is sitting right here, Mac Okubo, and uh, from Nisei Insurance. He should be actually the one up here talking. He's a lot more entertaining than I am as well. Um, and uh, Doug Barnett also is from our working group also here in the audience. And so we are looking at how, uh, what, what are the constraints and impediments to more institutional investment in infrastructure. Um, uh, again, this is not, we're not the only ones working on this. The IIF has a work stream on this. OECD has been working on it for a while. Um, uh, we're looking, looking at it specifically with, uh, with Asia in mind. Um, and we have uh, come up with uh, constraints in three areas. One is, I'll just go over them very briefly, one is regulation and, uh, and accounting practices. So as everyone knows, there's a lot of global regulatory changes happening now. Um, they're, they're just now coming to the non-bank side of these, of these discussions and how um, capital, in particular capital standards are going to be applied to, to non-banks, um, to insurance companies, both, both uh, um, average size as well as the very the systemically important ones. Um, is going to be very important about it. It's it, it going to affect very much our ability to fund long-term, uh, to, to, to buy long-term assets and carry them. Uh, the, uh, and there's another, some other accounting, uh, regulatory issues that are also important. The, the risk weighting that's placed on long-term uh, infrastructure bonds, for example. Um, it, Solvency II in Europe has placed a very high um, risk weighting on that. That's going to be that's going to be, it makes it, it makes it more difficult for European insurers to, to, to fund uh, infrastructure. Accounting, I won't go into the details, but basically a, a accounting that, that results in lots of volatility in our balance sheets will make it very difficult for us to fund long-term assets. And then we look at a series, the next bucket of, um, of issues um, has to do with, uh, with the things we've been talking about today, so I won't go over it, but basically market, we call it market uh, aspects, um, uh, governance, project preparation. Um, some of the ones that uh, maybe are a little bit different and special to us are we need financial instruments in which to, in which to invest that have credit ratings um, that uh, we're, we're extremely low risk uh, um, uh, uh, investors. So we need to, we need to have, to have uh, the financial instruments that would, uh, would facilitate our, our investment. Uh, securitization, for example, would be, you know, securitization has become a bad word. We need it to, we need, frankly, to come back because that's the best way to, to allocate risk and, and, uh, and basically uh, divide, up the, uh, divide up the financing between, for example, insurance companies and banks. Cause so, so it does make sense for banks to be in for the first five years because five-year maturity for a bank makes a lot of sense. And that's where the high, the high risk is and high returns are. We're interested in low risk, long returns. And so we're interested in more brownfield types of, of opportunities. So taking from five to 20 years. So, so there's ways to package those maybe through securitization. So we're looking at those kinds of issues. And then we're looking at op mark, uh, operational issues, um, credit rating, uh, um, there's a lot of of developing countries don't have proper credit credit rating bureaus. Um, we don't have a lot of experience in, in in infrastructure, so you know that those kinds of things we're we're looking at as well. So we've we've uh, listed those impediments up there in the interim report of APFF to the uh, to the ministries of uh, the, the APAC to the ministers of, fi of finance in APEC um, last November was it Mac? I think it was November, and um, and you can find it online if you're interested in our on our list, uh, Annex H is the uh, place to look. So thank you very much, I'll stop there. Thank you, Larry. Let me open it to questions now. Uh, you've been doing a great job of waiting for the microphone and introducing yourself. Uh, this round, because we have uh, four panelists, if there's a question to a specific panelist, please let them know, otherwise we'll, uh, we'll uh, make, it, make them jump balls. So, uh, any questions or? Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. Hi. <coughs> Uh, thank you. Very interesting. Um, I'm Ellen Frost from the East-West Center and National Defense University. Um, Mr. Khan, you mentioned that when you talk to private sector representatives, they say that projects that they would otherwise like to invest in are encumbered. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate. Are they talking about what uh, some of us think of as sound financial practices, the kind of conditions ensuring open procurement, transparency, and so on? Or are they talking about encumbrances that you think yourself are excessive. This is the conditionality issue. I'd love some comments. Thank you. Yeah, so encumbrances can be, can take many forms, so thank you for the question. 
uh, what I was talking about was very simple uh, meaning of the word encumbrance, which is there's a project, there's a road which could have been a toll road, which could have been structured as a toll road where there is quite a bit of traffic for a variety of economic reasons. That road, instead of being structured as a toll road, is structured as a public highway. That's what I mean. So when, you know, if I'm an investor who is building a book of business of buying toll road assets around the world, I look at this country and I said, I would love to, you know, this country is growing at a very good pace. I would love to ride this curve. I would have loved to have parked some money here and bought cash flows from this country. Uh, but the best road that I could have imagined where I would have felt comfortable taken to my investment committee and gotten an approval is now being structured as a public road. And it's got some donor helping the government to do feasibility study and so on and so forth. So I don't have a chance of getting involved in this project at all, and the government is feeling very comfortable. They'll get a loan from XYZ and build this road. So that's what I mean by encumbrance. And so as we sit here and talk about what these governments ought to do, it's also important for us to reflect on what are we doing. Uh, in terms of advising, and there are different parts of our organization. One wants to push the private sector, the other is engaged on the public sector, and, and, and there's need for some collaboration and understanding and clearing the market within these institutions is what I was trying to say. Questions? Yes, sir, here in the aisle. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Daisuke Garashi from the Japanese newspaper Asahi Shimbun. Uh, I have a question for uh, Alexia and uh, Craig about the China's uh, Asian Infrastructure Bank. I know that there are, there are many people who are skeptical you know, about the bank in the U.S. government, but I also heard that there are, there are some people who are seeing the potential of the new bank. So I just want to ask you how you see the potential uh, or, you know, of this AIB. Is, is it going to be a competitor for ADB or you know, is there anything possible to work with them if they have a good govern decent governance and transparency? Thank you. Thank you for the question. You know, I think we've just spent this entire panel talking about how large the channel the challenge is in front of us. So I think facing this challenge, we welcome, you know, any actor that has a role in in, in responding to the challenge. Now, as everybody has underscored, as we respond to the challenge, we want to make sure that we're building on lessons learned of how to respond well and how to build infrastructure well. So I think actors that come in that um, are applying the lessons learned around the issues that everyone's been talking about, whether it's procurement, whether it's debt sustainability, whether it's sort of good environmental management, whether it's the governance and transparency issues that have been discussed, if those lessons are implemented and applied, I think we need everybody um, that, that, that we can to, to help us uh, address this challenge, including some of the more uh, recent new actors coming to the scene um, that you were referring to. Um, <clears throat> the ADB's position is that AIB is understandable, given the region's huge financing needs and provided that AIB adheres to the same safeguards as the ADB and other multilateral banks and development partners uh, on environment and resettlement and procurement and governance, uh, et cetera, then, um, yeah, the more financiers out there for infrastructure in the region, the better. Um, let me sort of spin this a different way. My own personal experience uh, working with AIB's Secretary General, Jin Lee Kun, another one of my former bosses, <laughs> and Larry's, actually you should ask this to Larry, Larry not to me, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I was, um, first of all, uh, I'll make this real fast. I went to him with a couple colleagues to uh, talk about a regional road project uh, before it went to the board, just to, you know, brief him on what issues the board was raising in private, which they would, were likely to raise during the board discussion. And he flipped through the document and he said, I don't see um, plans in here for dealing with HIV AIDS and human trafficking and drug trafficking. And you know, this is 10 years ago and we kind of looked at him like, you know, what? And, and, and he said, uh, 
he had visited this area, he knew it well, you know, these were concerns and how are we going to mitigate, uh, mitigate these, these, these things from occurring? And we said, well, we'll deal with it. And he said, that's not good enough. And he kind of slammed the document down on his desk and said, go back and tell your boss, not Larry, but uh, <laughs> uh, my other boss, uh, that he doesn't want to see another regional anything unless it addresses these three issues. Now, this is before ADB had safeguards in these areas. So, you know, everyone's giving AIB a bit of a bum rap, I think, saying that, oh, are they going to adhere to our safeguards? Well, my experience working with the head of AIB is that he was thinking about these safeguards even before we were. Another quick story is that uh, I traveled with him in Tajikistan across some road. It was in really bad shape. He said somebody should do something. Um, three weeks later, we drove across the same road, and there was a Chinese construction crew out there working on it. And in three weeks, the Chinese government had approved $903 million for Tajikistan and mobilized a construction crew to get out there and start repairing this road. And, and that was impressive. Now, I think AIB's comparative advantage in all of this, and then I'll be quiet, is that they're fast. You know, I think that's one of the most important motivations for establishing AIB, is that they'll be fast. And in a region that's struggling with catching up you know, with infrastructure requirements, it, you know, ADB and World Bank, we have our role. The governments have their own, private investors and so forth. You know, financing's not really a problem. Developing projects is a problem, but somebody's got to get this stuff done quickly. And maybe it won't be the way we do it, um, but it needs to be done quickly. If you're a leader of one of these countries, you want it done quickly. And I think that's where AIB is going to step in. Scott, could I? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no, I don't want to speak ahead of Treasury on this. Anyway. <laughs> no, super quickly. I just want to. I just want to uh, be on the record to say that Treasury uh, and people don't sometimes like it. We're equal opportunity naggers, <laughs> meaning we ask the same questions to everybody. When the World Bank was creating the global infrastructure facility that I just mentioned, we said. Will your standards, will your safeguards, will your golden standards also apply? So I just want to be clear that we're, um, um, we treat, no one is particularly special. We treat everybody the same way on these issues. So, uh, Staying with uh, the nagging th uh, theme, um, <laughs> as somebody who, is, uh, who worked with uh, APAC to set up APIP and various other initiatives uh, with ASEAN, my nag is uh, slightly different. I, I think that all the discussion with um, these institutions has been all about safeguards. Will they have the standards? Will they not have the standards? And I want to raise a separate nag, which is from the private sector community. The question is not that everybody knows there's so much money needed to build the infrastructure. The question is simply, is this new institution or any other existing institution, are they going to clear the lane for private capital to flow into infrastructure? Or are they going to create more obstacles and create more problems. That's the, that's the fundamental question. If you want Asia to meet the promise of the kind of infrastructure that's required to sustain that growth, which the whole world needs from Asia, then we need to make sure that these lanes are being opened and not uh, closed or made more difficult. And that's a question nobody seems to be asking about this new institution or existing institutions enough. I know ADB board ha had made a very, very uh, strong statement two years ago, and ADB has been moving down that path to become a supporter of private capital. I know uh, World Bank is doing, and I think this is a question that any new institution coming up needs to answer as well. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a really important point, but and, and I almost make it a bit more positive in the sense that the, the question is how can the MDBs leveraged their relatively small role in terms of total financing, eight, you know, uh, eight percent or whatever it is, um, and bring in this much larger amount of private sector money. And so, uh, and because we in the private sector actually we we have a huge incentive to have the MD, MDBs involved in a project, even if it's only five percent, because since the MDBs are the governments, you know, that that's a, a great way of uh, mitigating political risk for us. And political risk is a major, major problem. <laughs> So you know, having having the MDB there is great, but we don't need you to be big in it. We just, we in fact, we just need you to be there, 
to provide that comfort. Um, so, you know, and, and frankly, Kamran has already mentioned it, the incentive systems uh, in the government, he mentioned, this incentive systems in, frankly, the MDBs are also the same way. It's a pain in the neck to do uh, private sector uh, co-financing. It's just, the, it's for the project manager, it, he doesn't get any, any more rewards for, from doing it, and, uh, and he gets a lot more work. And so we also have to find ways within, within our, the institutions to give them the incentive to do more of this uh, work with the private sector. Yeah, that's interesting that you, the notion of, of catalyst, as, as the multilateral says catalysts, and for my, my chemistry days, catalysts speed up reactions, okay? That's the purpose of them. And speed is the issue in Asia. All of you, uh, everybody in the room has traveled to Asia. And when you watch what's going on there, it's all about speed. So I think uh, the, this is a very interesting component that I wanted to draw out. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, that will be a rather uh, comments, but uh, uh, the following the uh, Larry's comments. Could you tell us who you are okay. and who you represent? Yes, uh, my name is Makoto Kubo, uh, Nippon Life Insurance Company, and based in New York. And I'm uh, serving as a shelper of the APFF Insurance and Retirement Inc. Mark Stream, mm -hmm. together with the colleague in ABAC. So um, then uh, today I learned that there was the explosion of the water pipe here, and some of you might be affected. This is why you need insurance. <laughs> but this is not. But this is not why I'm here today, because the, we are working on a long-term project. So and then the uh, our the uh, among the different mandates of the work stream, one of the mandates is how to promote long-term investments, including infrastructure investments. As Larry mentioned, maybe the uh, insurance company and pension fund have a long-term vision. And also, very important thing is that we can have a money received from the customers. We can keep it for a long time. So we don't need any cash until we pay. It tends to be maybe 30 years, 40 years. So we don't need to have the profits today. We don't care what is the current market, current price. We would like to have a growth for a long time when we have to pay to the customers in 30 years, 40 years. Don't you think that this kind of growth opportunities would be ideal investments for us? But this is only uh, possible if the regulation would allow us to do. If the bank-centric regulations are copied for insurance company, we need to seek liquidity instead of long-term growth. And if the short-term economic-based regime require us, for example, uh, to, to have all, at all time at a good position at any given moment. So we need to care today or tomorrow instead of 30 years or 40 years ahead when actually we need the money. So that would be the constraints for us to invest in long-term investments, including infrastructure investment. This is one issue. And another one is about the uh, insurance companies are expected by the society to cover some sort of longevity solution. As you probably know, the people don't die very easily nowadays. <laughs> you, we have the disasters everywhere, and we, we work too much, and also we have a lot of problems and agonies, but still our life expectancy is becoming longer and longer. Mysterious, huh? Maybe we may be too busy to die. Uh, too many projects to work on. <laughs> but in that case, the insurance company are very good candidates to cover this because we have a mortality risk exposure. So we can offset between the mortality risk and longevity risk. But it is only possible if we are successful promoting the long-term investment, including infrastructure. So we want to have win-win-win situation to make our dream come true, and I think this, is can, this can be done. Lastly, I'm a Japanese, but don't look at me like an alien, because I live in New York, and I pay tax in the States, and very happy that my money is used to support region through the US government. Thank you very much. As I mentioned, Mr. Rokubo is much more entertaining than I am, so <laughs> th thanks a lot for that, Mac. Is there a final question before we wrap up today? Yes, sir. Um, just to stir the pot a little bit, uh, once upon a time, Larry made a speech and said, 
the battle for climate change will be won or lost in Asia. And we've talked about infrastructure, and we've talked about the huge uh, investments. <laughs> but these are the investments that are going to be on the ground for the next 40, 50 years. Nobody's talked about the path of these investments. Are we going to make them more green? Are they going to be more uh, climate friendly? We talked about roads and the needs for road investments. You also talked about, however, public transportation uh, and other things. Um, and, and I think perhaps I'd like to ask the panel, and perhaps you also, what your thoughts are on, on how we can also move that, that investment needs to, uh, to consider sustainability, climate change, these concerns. Thank you. Jump ball. I mean, I, I'll just, I mean, I, I, I speak very quickly, um, so you may have missed it, but I actually did mention climate when I spoke and climate proofing investments. So I think, you know, since this is the closing question too, we are looking for sustainable infrastructure that will have the most longevity possible so that we don't have to keep on reinvesting and not addressing what it means to build. Um, the kind of infrastructure that will be permanent and sustainable given the new challenges that climate you know, places on, on our countries, and, and, and you're right that Asia um, is, is particularly vulnerable there, I think does not make sense. Will it cost more? This is not my area of expertise, um, but my sense is that in some cases, absolutely. And so this issue of viability and this issue of are, you know, are projects viable? What is going to be the cash flow for projects is already a challenge, even before you factor in the climate issues. So I think as we work on how to structure deals, as we work on the right financing mix for different kinds of projects, we have to build this, this in up front. And I do think that as we experiment with how to do this, again, if you look at the different financing flows, I think there is scope in terms of experimenting and innovative, innovating in terms of how to do this, there is scope for MDB financing to try out different options that then later on can be scaled up by, by the private sector. And then my last word will be that the goals of clearing the lanes for the private sector, the issues of viability and the issues are, of sustainability to me are completely intertwined. And when they're positioned as opposites, I think that's a really false debate. How to intertwine them smartly, effectively, efficiently, flexibly, and with speed is hard to do. But that's where the debate should be. I would just add two comments. Uh, one, I think the clean environment issue is something that you need, you need to address at two levels. We tend to always talk about it at the project level. Is this a clean project? Is this not a clean project? And the real solution is at a higher level, which is what is the <clears throat> living environment that we are planning for the future? <clears throat> Excuse me. So this would be more in line with what kind of cities do we want in the future? And then the, you figure out whether how many roads you will need or what kind of, uh, what kind of infrastructure that would involve that kind of concept of living. There's not enough discussion going on in Asia about that. Uh, there's much more, uh, you know, the Asians are talking about the new cities and, and, and so on, but any time that the engagement happens from the West, it's more about the project level. And what, are, what standards are you using? Is this gonna be clean or not? And so I think there's a disconnect there that needs to be resolved. The second thing is, all things Asia, you know, um, if people can make money through that, there's likely to be a higher uptake on the concept. And so you see that, uh, you know, the, uh, all of the solar technology, the panels, I mean, that, there's a big market there and there's an uptake in Asia as well because it's homegrown technology, people are making money from it, it makes economic sense, therefore it also makes social sense. And I think as long as we, continue to have this dialogue which has a disconnect that some technology is being forced on Asia, which is not really a source of economic growth for Asia. You will continue to have this um, disconnect, which really there shouldn't be when we talk about the three tiers of bottom line and so on. So I, I think there's a lot of work to be done there and it is more soft stuff than hard stuff. Thank you. and. Uh First, thanks to all of you for investing your mornings with us. I hope it was beneficial. And please join me in thanking our panel.